Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone. I am uh, glad to uh, connect with you another time and uh, we are ready to attend the last one of Integral Design and Research Lecture Series by Mark Decay from the University of Tennessee, who is a visiting professor at the U of University of Venice since the beginning of March. So as many of you know, Mark uh, is full professor uh, of architecture, specializing in sustainable design theory, research and design tools. His current work concerns various applications of integral theory in the experience of sustainable uh, design and to experience nature via buildings. As a visiting professor, Mark is working in UAV with the IRID research staff that is within the research infrastructure for uh, an integral design environment. In IRID, the Pride Laboratory that I have the pleasure to coordinate has organized and edited this uh, lecture series as part of his uh, activities aiming at uh, developing uh, studies on the modification and innovation of design paradigms in an analytical dimension of complexity and within an integrated vision of project cultures. The lectures are introducing uh, a framework for thinking about design and design research at any scale. It is an approach built on the, the integral theory and uh, developed for uh, architecture in the, the case book, Integral Sustainable Design Transformative Perspectives. The collaborative teams uh, presented in the Integral Design and Research Lecture Series use this approach for, uh, is, for its uh, usefulness in tackling and making sense of the difficult and complex problems facing the designing and planning disciplines today. Well, in a few minutes, we will attend a lecture by Mark Decay with Melanie Watchman. Melanie is an intern architect and PhD candidate in architecture at the University Laval in Canada. Her doctoral research focuses on uh, biophilic design in school architecture. She is particularly interested in uh, how experience, experiences of uh, nature in uh, cold climates can contribute to the well-being of students and uh, school staff. She is currently working with uh, GRAP, the research group on physical uh, environment, and the research project SCOLA, expertise platform in school architecture, which aims to inform the renovation of school in Quebec. Well, the title of this fifth lecture is uh, Integral Nature Connections, Philia and Stork. This lecture addresses the qualitative uh, perspective of experiences, that is biophilia, as well. Uh, well, we are ready to attend this last lecture on integral design and research. Thank you to all the participants of the last ones. Thank you, Mark and Melanie. The floor is yours. Mark the microphone, sorry. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be back with you again for number five in this lecture series with uh, Mark and collaborators. Uh, really happy with all of my collaborators uh, that we've been able to work with and bring to you. We have another one today. I'm very pleased to be joined by Melanie Watchman from Laval University in Quebec City. Uh, she's just completed her doctoral thesis uh, on the topic. Uh, we'll see a portion of that work here today. 
in, I think it was 2019, Melanie came and visited here uh, at the University of Tennessee as an assistant research professor um, for about six months. And during that time, we collaborated on works that she had already begun on this topic of biophilic design. Our topic today uh, combines this with some other ideas. Uh, we call it Integral Nature Connections, Philia and Storge, and I'll explain that. We talked in lecture three with Suzanne Bennett about the major role that buildings have in climate change that architects have begun to wake up to the fact that buildings run almost entirely on fossil fuels. And conventionally, most people assume that sustainable design simply has to solve this technological problem to reduce its impacts on climate by cutting down on emissions and saving energy and things like that. But we've also covered in previous lectures how we can look at sustainable design as a problem that can be seen from each of these four fundamental perspectives from Wilbur's integral design approach. So similarly, we can see that in the upper right behaviors perspective, we think of that as the elements, the, um, the plants, the animals, the rocks, the trees, and that we call the terrain of the bio or biology, which also includes the physical environment, the physio. Uh, in the lower right, we can talk about nature as context, or it's the realm of the eco or ecological. In the upper left, we look at nature experiences. In that terrain, we talk about that as the area of philia to the Greeks, they're always helpful. In this case, biophilia or love of nature, affiliation for nature, friendship with nature. And then in the lower left, storge, another Greek word for love, meaning empathy bond of familial love, kinship, allegiance. There is some community that you are associated with in this sense of being connected. And it's on these left side approaches, these left side ways of looking at designing in relationship to nature that we focus on today. There's a lot of work that's been done in the exteriors and strategies and modeling systems and understanding ecologies and so forth. But not nearly enough, we think, on the left hand quadrants when we look at designing for nature. So uh, Melanie's going to begin with the topic of philia, and I will finish up with storge or the cultural component looking at narratives. So without further ado, Melanie, please take over. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure for me to join you today and to present a portion of my thesis work, uh, which is supervised by Claude Demers and André Potvin at the Université Laval in Quebec, Canada. Now, this research is part of the um, research group SCHOLAR, which aims to inform the renovation of both primary and secondary schools. That's why lots of the examples you'll see today are of school environments and particularly those in cold climates. As Mark was mentioning, uh, while, I had, uh, while I was visiting at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, I had the pleasure of um, working with him and developing a few biophilic design schemas. And so some of the work that will be presented today is that um, the result of that collaboration. So I've decided to structure the presentation around three main topics. Uh, the first of which is um, nature and biophilic design. So developing a more theoretical reflection to see how we can understand uh, nature experiences. In the second portion, I'll briefly contextualize the reflection uh, that I had in my um, doctoral research to talk a little bit about um, primary schools in Quebec. And then I'll finish in the third portion by talking about the biophilic design schemas uh, that were developed as a design response to some of the challenges and opportunities that we have for biophilic design in um, the cold climate of Quebec. 
So in the fourth first portion, as I was mentioning, I want to present a more theoretical reflection uh, to better understand what is nature, what is biophilic design, and how can a better understanding of these two terms help us understand uh, biophilic experiences that we want to incorporate in the buildings. So to begin, a brief definition of biophilic design, which is the deliberate attempt to translate an understanding of the inherent human affinity to affiliate with natural systems and processes known as biophilia into the design of the built environment. Now biophilia and even the notion of biophilic design are relatively recent terms, yet we can see that architects have been incorporating and in, um, nature in buildings uh, for a long time and have been trying to create uh, connections uh, between people and nature in this sense. We've been talking a lot about nature and as I was mentioning, is especially as we are promoting uh, more and more biophilic design. But what exactly does that mean to connect people with nature? What is the nature we are trying to connect people with? Uh, there are lots of different ways of defining nature, lots of different elements that can be considered natural and according to some authors, uh, some elements that are not natural. Uh, what we are proposing is a simple classification. So three broad categories with different levels of complexity. So if we look on the left, the first category are natural forces. So this includes water, uh, ice, snow. It also includes uh, light, air, uh, fire and earth. So the, the first category of what we can call the elements of nature. In the center, we have living organisms. So this second category combines both animals and plants. And finally, the third category is the living systems. So when we combine both natural forces and living organisms to have a full ecosystem. So these three broad categories are considered uh, helpful to understand the type of nature we want to connect people to and in turn the types of experiences that that can generate in buildings. We go one step further. So keeping these three same categories, we then distinguish uh, those that occur in a steady state versus when we are talking about daily, seasonal and annual variations of nature. So for instance, if we look at plants, uh, we can consider a tree outside our window right now in its current state, but we can also analyze its foliage that will change in color or change in density throughout the year. So the two examples of different types of nature, even though they're in the same category of living organisms, that also have different levels of complexity and that will impact how we design and experience buildings. Why is biophilic design important? Um, I think there are many different studies that have shown the, whether it's health and well-being benefits of connecting to nature, the financial benefits when it's included into office environments, and even in terms of school environments, there's lots of research that has been done to show that just how positive it can have an impact on academic achievement. Um, when we look at schools in Quebec, we see that uh, this example shows sometimes there are certain biophilic components, uh, such as windows to the outside that may or may not have a nature view, but that allow some daylight into the classroom. Um, but I think from an architectural perspective, one of the main reasons why biophilic design is important is simply because we spend most of our time indoors. And so buildings become the way nature is or is not experienced most of the time. For instance, in Quebec, the school hours, children are generally there from 8 a.m. to about 3 p.m. But the majority of children attend either before and after school care. So that means that for some children, they are at school from 7 a.m. to about 6 p.m. And especially during winter with early sunset, it means that if they don't benefit from natural light throughout the day while they're either learning in school or going outside for recess, well, this is really the only opportunity they have to experience um, nature throughout the day. So it's important to consider that in the design and particularly in the renovation of school environments. There are lots of different research, there are guidelines that have been produced to help us better understand benefits of nature, but also how to incorporate that into the design of the built environment. And looking at all these different patterns and strategies and principles through an integral lens um, really helped better understand where the current emphasis is and what's missing currently in um, biophilic design literature. So using the four quadrants uh, that Mark just presented, 
it's possible to see how um, biophilic design and how nature can be seen through this um, lens. So on the objective side, we have, of course, the um, bio, the natural elements, and then the um, eco, because we're considering nature in relation to its architectural context. On the left subjective side, uh, we have the philia, so that, as Mark was mentioning, the, the core of the presentation today focuses on the left-hand side with nature experiences and nature meanings. Now, if we take these four quadrants and try to see where uh, the biophilic design currently is located, um, I want to show just a few examples of what exactly we mean by um, how each principle could be incorporated into these four quadrants. So for instance, um, on the bio side, there are many different um, principles and strategies that exist. Um, but one example would be the use of natural materials and natural textures, uh, even floral um, or botanical motifs on different surfaces. In terms of um, eco, so the objective collective quadrant, um, here we have examples such as interior courtyards, in between spaces, transitional spaces, so really connecting um, natural elements within the architectural context. In terms of the upper left quadrant, uh, we can have um, strategies or patterns that include views, so really how occupants experience nature. Uh, other patterns would be um, principles such as prospect and refuge, so the possibility to have a look out far into the distance while having a certain protection, a certain um, sense of refuge. And the missing perspective at the moment in biophilic design literature, or at least the perspective that is um, underdeveloped in comparison to the others, is that of cultures. It seems as if what um, authors mean by nature is so deeply embedded uh, in their work that it's um, not necessarily articulated into design um, principles and strategies. So the examples uh, here in this um, presentation were simply to illustrate uh, or to better understand how we define um, biophilic design in each of the quadrants. But as I was mentioning, there are many different principles that exist that have been developed by different authors. And when we put them all together, it's interesting to see just how much is on the objective side, just how much is uh, quanti quantifiable, measurable, tangible elements of design and how there are less elements and the subjective, um, the subjective quadrants. So moving forward, we decided to center a human experience or the philia of biophilia at the core of our reflection and to see how other design elements such as ideas and meaning of nature, um, how form and space, and even how um, climatic condensed considerations could be used to form and better understand our human experience in buildings. Now, in the case of my research, I was particularly interested in um, children's experience as uh, the goal is to renovate school environments. Of course, children are the key, uh, the, the key users of these buildings. And so it was interesting to see how at different developmental stages, sorry, um, children may understand or appreciate nature differently. So without going into the detail of how each of these different authors views um, the lines of development of um, children and how environmental values form. I think what's interesting to notice from a design perspective is the alignment that exists among these different authors and to see the importance of fostering um, fundamental, uh, tangible uh, experience of the physical world before moving on to a more uh, rational understanding of the um, natural phenomena that are going on in the environment. So using this understanding of increasing complexity as uh, children learn and explore and understand their environment, we adapted that into a model of biophilic experiences. And this model serves to understand, uh, for instance, design precedents, to analyze and to better understand the type of experience that they are generating, but also as designers to see what type of um, experience we want to foster when we design buildings. So the first level that we see is that of um, sensation. So as I was mentioning, um, fostering and really the, discussing the environmental stimuli that affect sensory organs. Uh, so for instance, this can be qualifying a space in terms of thermal experience, such as hot and cold, in terms of acoustic experience, uh, quant 
also qualifying the amount of um, light, so whether it's a bright or dark space, uh, thinking about um, fragrances and textures. The next level up is that of effect. So just to see how feelings and thoughts about these sensations uh, translate into our experience of nature. So while these, of course, um, this effect is influenced by other factors, it's possible to see how, for instance, a thermal contrast within a space might create uh, a sense of delight in um, someone that is experiencing the space. The third level is understanding. Uh, so through a knowledge of the natural forces, organisms, um, the different processes that are going on in our environment through learning and experience. So this can include, for instance, uh, knowing at what time of the day the sun will come through and warm a space and understanding what that means in terms of um, a space in relation to its context. And the last level is that of affiliation. So the formation of close relationships. Uh, this can be, for instance, a sense of place or a connection with nature. Kellett mentions the importance of um, biophilic design to, uh, to get that innate affiliation that people have with nature. And so while he does say that it is innate, he also mentions that it is developed through learning and experience. And so similarly to the different developmental stages of children, this is what this model tries to express. The importance of thinking about sensations um, the direct physical experience of the built environment that can then lead to um, the development of better understanding and ultimately an affiliation with nature. Now I've chosen a few uh, examples uh, to help us better see how these four different um, types of experiences can be used to understand the space. Um, so for instance, here we have an example of a, a kindergarten that has an interior courtyard that is open to the sky. And so this space allows rain to fall and then be collected at the bottom. And as we can see on the photograph on the left, that the children are having a, a rich sensory experience of this space, uh, hopefully enjoying and having a positive experience of nature. The photograph on the right shows how the courtyard offers different um, zones in the sun and in the shade, depending on the solar, um, the path of the sun. And so again, this could be fostering an understanding of um, solar paths in addition to the experience of hot and cold and um, sun and shade. In the second example, uh, we have uh, similarly the a sense of touch, the haptic connect connection to space, the possibility to turn and move uh, these uh, wooden panels to allow light to enter or to block sun heat out of the classroom. So thinking about it from a child's perspective, uh, we can imagine that this uh, immediate sense of a touch uh, creates a positive experience and a personalization of the space, but can also lead to a better understanding of at what time of the day do we want light to come in or do we want to keep the, to block heat from coming in. In this third example, uh, we see, of course, the seasonal diversity uh, that is present in this school and how that can impact uh, people's experience of nature. So whether it's with the fragrant uh, greenery or the um, snow that is covering the landscape. This can also show how, in, how architectural uh, features come and can be intertwined with uh, the different uh, availability of nature. So for instance, we have this um, lovely area on the left-hand side that could be used for sliding or sledding, uh, for instance, throughout the year. So now that we have a better understanding of what we mean by nature and what we mean by biophilic design, uh, it becomes interesting to see how we can foster biophilic experiences, particularly in the context of um, cold climate schools. Now in Quebec, like elsewhere in the world, most of our schools were built uh, in the 50s, 60s and 70s in response to the baby boom. And these schools have now um, are now 50 years old and are in need of renovations. And so as part of the Scholar Research Project, we are trying to first understand the schools that we have in Quebec and then see how we can renovate them to better suit the current needs and um, expectations of its uses. So some of my colleagues have done in-depth analysis of different typologies of school buildings that we find. Um, today, I simply wanted to use these two examples to illustrate 
the diversity of buildings that we have, yet also the similarities of some of the challenges and opportunities that we face in terms of biophilic design. So as you can see on the top, we do have some thin plan buildings uh, that offer the opportunity, for instance, for daylight and cross ventilation, and then some thicker buildings that make that a little bit more challenging, particularly at the core of the building. Another element that is readily apparent is the big schoolyards that we have, so lots of outdoor space. Uh, this is often covered in asphalt, and so we just have a little bit of greenery at the perimeter of most schools. There are also a very few um, sheltered outdoor spaces. So that means that most of the learning takes place indoors, and uh, when students are outside, um, they're completely exposed to the elements. So there are very few schools that have these in-between or um, semi-enclosed spaces that would facilitate outdoor learning activities. Another interesting feature of uh, Quebec is, of course, its seasonal diversity. In the biophilic design literature, we're often talking about green views, green grass, green trees, having pleasant uh, green outdoor environment. Well, that's true for part of the year in Quebec. However, for most of the school year, there is a lot of snow on the ground. So from about November to April, uh, whenever children are outside for recess, or even if we try to have outdoor learning activities, it's more to acknowledge the presence of snow on the ground. And so this poses certain challenges, particularly during winter with early sunsets. However, the presence of snow on the ground offers other um, bioclimatic um, possibilities, such as include um, reflecting more light into interior spaces if those spaces are well designed in relation to the outdoor environment. And snow also offers a lot of uh, potential for children, uh, particularly during recess. And in addition to the architectural variables and the site topographies, like maintenance and I guess administrators way of dealing with snow also impacts uh, the way children will experience nature. So for instance, here on the top left, what we have is simply the schoolyard with its topography completely covered in snow, um, simply removing snow from the staircase to make sure we can access the building. The other, another school on the right hand side has on the contrary decided to come with snow plowers and shift the snow far away from the building, creating these large piles of snow um, while also showing the asphalt um, below the schoolyard. Now, both of these approaches offers children different opportunities to play and interact with snow. As we can see on the bottom left, uh, the children, as soon as the bell um, rang, they all ran outside and he headed straight for the, um, the large accumulations of snow that they could manipulate and slide on. And or on the right hand side, where other have um, examples of children building snowman or simply sliding on ice, these certain particularities at certain areas of the schoolyard. So considering the realities of the Quebec school climate and some of the elements that have been overlooked so far in biophilic design, um, we developed these biophilic design schemas. And so by schemas, what we mean is uh, a co combination of um, architectural form and space that can contribute to to foster or to design certain types of um, experiences in architectural spaces. Um, in collaboration with Mark, there were quite a few um, schemas that were developed, uh, most of those oriented towards learning environments and in Quebec. Um, and simply to, to clarify some certain what we mean by a schema, I've chosen one example today, um, so that is an example of a canopy place. So what you see here is a flashcard. So it's a, a schema presented in its most uh, simple form, uh, simply a logo illustrating the type of um, space that we have and a brief definition. So for instance here, we see that a canopy place uh, is enclosing overhead. Um, so here we have the architectural um, description creating a refuge. So the importance here of including the type of experience that we're trying to foster. And then uh, with a view or garden connection, highlighting the type of nature we are trying to connect to. Um, so these flashcards can be used as simple um, design uh, during the design process to illustrate or to accompany designers into clarifying certain intentions or certain types of spaces they are um, 
teen in developing. Because the importance is on um, better understanding the philia, better understanding the experiences of nature we are trying to promote, um, each schema has a brief uh, experiential description. So for instance here, um, the experience that we are trying to generate, uh, we're trying to, to foster in this space is illustrated with an example of a, a school project that was done by a, in a design studio supervised by um, Claude de Mers and André Potvin at um, Laval University in Quebec. And so what this shows is the importance of, of course, having a roof, so um, offering some sort of protection from elements, um, so whether it's sun and rain, um, and the importance of having this outdoor view, so this outdoor connection to something um, pleasant in the outdoor environment. And of course, because this um, research is uh, really connected to the cold climate of Quebec, well, we add certain precisions. So for instance, mentioning how um, connecting this canopy place to the building edge um, could really extend its use by offering it um, some sort of protection from the um, wind, for instance. And so here we have an example of a, a biophilic design schema uh, in its most developed uh, form. So again, starting with its name here at the top and a brief definition and the example that I had on the previous slide. Um, because of the importance of philia, the importance of the nature experience, we begin with this experiential description of the experience that we are trying to um, achieve in this space. We then go on to describe the architectural components that could be used or modulated to um, create this experience. And so that is done by considering the amount of, for instance, roof and walls, its proximity to a, the building edge, and also trying to describe how um, certain elements of nature are desired and we want to connect to or block or only um, partially uh, enable into the space. And similarly with um, this experience of, of vegetation. Now on the right hand side, so on page two, uh, here's when we come to analyze, uh, for instance, uh, a precedent, an example that already exists that reproduces some of these um, characteristics. And we also include um, a diversity of examples simply to show that, uh, for instance, each biophilic design schema can be um, expressed in a multitude of different ways, uh, depending on the design goals of each project. Um, each schema finishes with some design guidelines, so some key points um, that we think are important to achieve in order for this space to um, have the desired effect in terms of nature experiences and acknowledging that uh, this research um, could be in, enriched by future research, um, we have added a few um, research questions at the bottom. So the example that I was presenting is that of a canopy place. So we print, uh, position that at the scale of a room, so an architectural um, space that could foster biophilic experiences. Now, none of these schemas are um, thought to be uh, unique in the sense that it's not simply by creating a canopy place in a schoolyard uh, that we can say that we have a biophilic school. Of course, it's important to consider um, biophilic design interventions at different scales. So for instance, by creating a canopy place in a schoolyard, it could contribute to uh, an, a room organization of outdoor learning. Similarly, if we look at the elements that compose a canopy place, uh, we can identify the importance of not only a green view, but also thinking of a white view and see how that canopy place could be pleasant at different times of the year by encouraging um, views of uh, snow covered topography, for instance. The question mark added here at the bottom um, left illustrates that this is, uh, of course, a framework that is in development and that could be enriched by looking at a different climatic contexts or either different building programs better understand um, biophilic experiences and how different design elements can be um, brought together to foster a coherent um, biophilic building. So on the one part, it's important to think of um, biophilic design interventions in terms of building scales. So here you have some of the lower levels um, used in sun, wind and light um, to really describe architectural um, components. But given also the importance of only indoor spaces and outdoor spaces in the school environments in Quebec, it was interesting to see how we could develop a variety of biophilic design schemas that would also consider in between spaces. So for instance, here we see that the canopy place is a somewhat um, semi-enclosed space 
that tends to be used in the outdoor environment. So uh, multiple biophilic design schemas were developed by thinking specifically on um, learning environments and those in Quebec. Um, and here you have some of those identified uh, with green. Um, and it's interesting to see how they relate to the biophilic design schemas um, being developed by Mark um, with um, Gail Braga and to really develop a multitude of experiential um, design schemas. These biophilic design schemas were developed at the same time as Mark was teaching a design studio on um, sustainable and biophilic architecture. And so I want to show how these um, design schemas uh, were used by certain students develop some um, building addition um, proposals for schools in Quebec. So for instance, here in this building addition, uh, we have a semi-enclosed space um, in between two classrooms um, that has um, some um, vegetation and space. And so thinking about the different types of biophilic experiences, we can see how this um, fragrant vegetation could appeal to children's immediate sensory experience of space. Uh, the shape of the space and its solar orientation could also help children understand solar paths as the sun rotates around the building. And also thinking of um, teachers present, um, or for instance, the type of plantings that are um, selected for these um, vegetation areas could also um, highlight their affiliation um, to the sense of community and how they understand the role of the school in relation to its neighborhood. So another example um, of a school addition developed by another team of students, in this case, they used the biophilic design schema of a winter garden, uh, which aims to extend growing season. So to enable um, plants to continue to grow even in a snow uh, covered winter landscape. So what was interesting is that by thinking about uh, the positioning of this sun space in relation to classrooms, it, it brought them to uh, see the importance of um, solar exposure in their design. And also, in addition to thinking about a winter garden, um, it brought them to think about um, outdoor gardening areas that could be used at different times of the year. So to have those close by and even on the rooftops of um, their building addition. So in conclusion, I think a few key points of um, the ideas that I presented today, um, first of which is the potential to really enrich subjective assessments of biophilic design using an integral approach. So by positioning what we already know about biophilic design and the multiple biophilic design patterns and strategies that exist, it's possible to see how a lot of this research has currently focused on tangible, uh, measurable el architectural elements and a bit less on the subjective side. So in this sense, uh, we developed an exploratory model to emphasize these descriptions of biophilic experiences. So by considering sensations, affect, understanding, and affiliation with, affiliation with nature as being nested levels or contributing to um, developing a sense of connection with nature. Thirdly, um, biophilic design, it's important to consider in, bio, in different seasons, uh, particularly winter. And I think contextualizing that for the schools in Quebec really showed the importance of thinking not only about nature in terms of green um, vegetation and um, long warm summer days, but also thinking about um, nature experiences when it's cold outside, when days are shorter, and when it's a white snow covered landscape. Finally, uh, biophilic design schemas uh, here were proposed as a simplified visual representation of nature experiences. Um, they were also considered as being beneficial to help designers organize design strategies throughout building scales. So in this sense, biophilic design is not simply about having natural materials in indoor spaces or having abundant natural light. It's about making sure that we connect all these different biophilic design strategies together uh, so that we can have a coherent um, biophilic design proposal, uh, particularly in the case of um, renovating school buildings. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'd be pleased to answer um, and discuss this further with you. All right, we thought we might switch up the um, the format a little bit today and take some questions or a short discussion here before we move on to part two, because that's really going to change quadrants and change perspectives. 
So questions, uh, comments uh, for Melanie? I try to introduce the question time. So uh, I hope that uh, the participants may try some question. I would like to um, uh, understand better because the, um, the question uh, of uh, nature experience indoor mm -hmm. is something that is part of uh, architecture since uh, many, many years ago. Uh, that is uh, centuries uh, and the ancient architecture is made by um, ports, courts, and uh, a kind uh, of uh, construction that was uh, uh, part of the uh, of, of that thickness of the threshold. The threshold of the building is something that in the uh, architect the historical architecture is uh, is very important because uh, is the uh, condition to understand better also the the, the landscape uh, the the city and uh, in the architecture of the city we talk about uh, uh, urban rooms for the uh, for the square for the uh, for some spaces that are the a kind uh, of uh, of urban room, no, that is, a, and at the same time, the the canopy place is uh, is the porch in in uh, in the city, no. Uh, when uh, I look at the uh, the comparison between uh, the two season, winter and uh, and uh, spring, uh, in the in the threshold of buildings, I think about uh, uh, the the history of technology that uh, uh, tried to isolate the building. In any case, the, the isolation uh, has been uh, the the objective, uh, the the challenge for many years. We have to close the building and create another climax, another uh, another um, kind of sensation inside. In this moment, we are talking about uh, uh, the, the the permeability. I don't know if uh, it is uh, right uh, as a as a word. Uh, permeability and uh, the possibility to understand the that. The, um, the changeable of time, of season, of nature, of uh, of temperature, and uh, this is part that uh, that uh, is working uh, with uh, the ancient typology of architecture. I think there is no much new in this uh, uh, in this necessity, no, because architecture as uh, always expressed this relation uh, as a, a recovery, as a refuge, as a, something that cannot uh, close itself so much. Is it uh, a condition that uh, you can uh, uh, express in your research or something else we have to consider in a biophilic uh, approach. It's definitely a really interesting, um, I guess, return to what we used. It's almost as if in a lot of ways, biophilic design is helping us remember what we knew centuries ago when we were designing buildings and that with the ease of technology, uh, we sort of overlooked and then had these buildings that were completely disconnected to the outside. Um, talking about schools in particular, the threshold is uh, unoccupable, unoc uh, unoccupiable in the sense that 
there's barely any indoor or outdoor space. It's simply a door that will lead to the schoolyard and there is no way for that space to be to you to be used to its full potential. There is very little opportunities for children to be outside while also have being inside or to have these courtyards or um, loggias or any of these spaces that we find in the urban realm. Very few have been incorporated to the school designs of the 50s and 60s and 70s. And so I think you're right in that sense. It's finding a way to bring as much designers as building users to want to reconnect with um, what's going on outside and not simply say, well, it's a harsh outdoor winter climate. We need to be disconnected from the building. We prefer to have our indoor climate that is completely controllable. Um, I think there are certain ups and downs and there are, of course, certain inconveniences at times of being reliant on the outdoor climate entirely. But I think that's the way that we understand and we adapt and better use our buildings in that sense. Thank you. Yeah, you could say um, you can find examples of modern buildings, of course, that do have this permeability. We also have plenty of modern buildings that make themselves too transparent, too, too connected along one line, let's say view and admitting light. But at the same time, they're completely sealed and impermeable to sound or to air movement. Um, and then it, it does seem that as Melanie was showing the, tra the transformation typologically from thin buildings that depend upon primarily upon daylight to thick buildings that depend entirely on electric lights and entirely on mechanical conditioning. Uh, so we are, you know, in a sense, reverting typologically to some kinds of plan and section types that uh, give greater access. At the same time, um, when you move out of uh, Southern Europe, let's say into Northern Europe or into the, the Northern portions of North America, you also um, tend to see less of this liminal space, this threshold space, the in, what Melanie calls the in-between space. Um, and you can even see that in the progression of, of housing in most American cities from, let's say, 1900 to 1920s, late 1920s, Every, every home had a sleeping porch if it was in a warm climate. Every home had uh, maybe more than one outdoor covered space. As you move into the 30s, those begin to get cut off. And by the 1940s, there are no covered outdoor spaces in the majority of most uh, North American housing. So we progressed in the 20th century into efficiency logics and other kinds of logics out of at a cost, right? And so we're saying maybe the cost is our connection to the natural world. Other uh, other thoughts or questions? Please, from the research fellows, I ask uh, comment. Someone is working about nature and someone wo is working about schools. Very good. Well, why don't you work on those questions, you folks that are working on schools and working on nature, and then bring those back to us uh, when we come back at the end. So shall we okay. move on? We can come back. Another, yeah. another question about okay. nature inside. Sorry. Uh, no, sorry. When I look, when I look uh, at the the project of school, the nature uh, inside is a kind of furniture. It's not really nature. It's uh, something that uh, always uh, create uh, um, in many in many times. Uh, the, the, the furniture to play inside with nature uh, is something uh, that uh, uh, is connected with the, the educational uh, 
programs, the, the educational programs, but something else uh, about the wellness produced by nature. Is, uh, is in your experience uh, expressed by some architecture, some uh, uh, some uh, work that uh, that are in your uh, in your experience as researchers? Well, I think thinking about um, interior design and thinking about furniture, and particularly, um, is interesting in many regards. Um, the first of which is, of course, this thinking of biophilic design at every design scale. And so, yes, for instance, we can have this wonderful canopy place, but we will need uh, to have furniture. And so by thinking of something that is coherent and that aligns with what's going on is important. And in terms of natural materials, for instance, used um, in interior spaces, it can be interesting. Um, one argument is particularly when there is not a lot of nature outside, uh, for instance, in certain environments when we can't transform the schoolyard and we can't make it a green or white oasis, it can be interesting to have these complementary design strategies to incorporate nature in a different way. So to continue to offer a tactile experience to students, even if other um, sensory uh, triggers can't be present. Okay, thank you, Melanie. <laughs> we can go on, I think. Uh, hi, can you hi. hear me? Sorry, can you hear me or see me? Yes. Uh, hi, nice to meet you, Melanie. I'm I'm Stefano Tornieri, one of the research fellows in the UAV. I and I'm working on nature, but <laughs> being also an architect, I'm also <laughs> interested in design, in design. Uh, process, you know. So this this question of uh, relation with nature is always uh, on top. You know, I, I first of all I think that uh, when you see a building with this connection with nature, for me simply is a good architecture. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't mean I I don't know if it's biophilic design, but actually I, as uh, Margarita said before, most of the great architecture in the world. Uh, are, most of them are has itself a disconnection. Maybe it's different uh, because uh, in the contemporary era, nature changes uh, meaning somehow, for example. And in this case, my question is about uh, when I, I, I know some architecture with uh, using uh, some hyper technological facade, for example, uh, using uh, algae producing uh, uh, oxygen from the CO2 uh, components. Uh, uh, in this case, for example, which is another kind of nature, do you think it's still, uh, still the same uh, biophilic design or we are going in another, <laughs> in another uh, place? <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, question because in addition to having, for instance, I guess this um, high tech or completely mechanical um, systems in buildings, what happens when you start to have um, electric lighting that is mimicking the daylighting patterns outside? Is that considered to be a natural pattern or not? And I think for some um, designers it is and for others it isn't. And it's hard sometimes to trace that line in the sand um, because there is a certain I guess there's a certain risk involved, uh, particularly when we know the importance of light on the circadian system, for instance, um, day and night patterns. It can be I guess, tr troubling or there's a slight risk in when we start to manipulate these patterns that they overbalance or don't reflect what's going on in the outdoor environment. And so I guess ideally when there's enough, uh, the nature patterns are so rich outdoors, whether it's in summer or winter, or spring and autumn, I think those are the patterns that can be important to foster first. And then as I was mentioning, perhaps in response to the vert, um, to, when there is no nature present, well then there's other strategies such as the natural materials or the algae that you were mentioning on facades or even artificial um, lighting patterns that can be created indoors. Uh, Stefano, I think there's a couple of ways to 
look at that question. Um, one is that the automated, uh, if you're talking about, let's say, a complex uh, uh, computer driven uh, double facade system with shading and the windows open and everything, um, is that designed to to manage the uh, energy and keep the keep the conditions in some engineering definition of, of, of acceptable? Or is it designed to provide the maximum delight, the maximum joy to the to, to the occupants? So that's a that's one shift, right? It's between the engineering mentality and instead, which is which is managing our upper right performance and maybe doing a great job at it. Um, but it, can we also now think about managing all of those things in order to create experiences that we prefer? Um, so from the integral standpoint, we're not so much interested in saying this is nature, this is not nature. This is um, biophilic design and something else is not. What, what we have instead is multiple perspectives, all of which have something to say about nature and something to say about biophilic design and how people experience it. So. Um, if we go back to Melanie's model there of looking at sensation and affect and understanding and uh, affiliation, then probably the mechanical envelope is controlling something about sensation. And mostly they're designed to have us not have um, an actual affect, not have a feeling. So it's missing the other three in particular because, and I would just argue that, you know, it could be more sophisticated if it actually engaged the human being and in, in participating. Because then it's not just managed by the computer in the background, but where possible, we're actually having a relationship, right? So that I can open my window, I can adjust my lighting, adjust my shading, um, adjust my view, my privacy, all of those things that can happen at the edge of the building. That then can, I think, build relationship. And that's where, where the interesting thing about looking at the left-hand quadrants is that um, we actually want people to have experiences so that they then have a relationship with whatever idea of nature they have. And out of that, then we can, because we care about things that we get related to, people that we get related to, then we do things for those people that are good things and not bad things. And that's what's missing out of just looking at it as a, as a technical problem. Good question. Thank you. So precise and <laughs> thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. And we're going to move into part two, the lower left. And this part, this, this is on the theme of Storge, uh, which, in which we're asking, how can architects address issues of uh, designing with nature and in particular I'm going to take climate change as one of the themes here. And so how can architects address uh, climate change by designing to place people into these kind of rich and significant relationships with nature that we've begun to introduce. Uh, in Melanie's analysis you saw that uh, the lower left was the missing territory and so that's what I'm going to try to fill in a bit here. These ideas were first developed in part four of Integral Sustainable Design, the book, uh, which dove into how to design uh, to connect people to nature and to connect people that have different worldviews. So not one nature, but many natures. And then these themes were further developed and expanded into this paper 
for the Integral European Conference in 2018. This paper won the Best Academic Paper Award at the conference. And the approach that we used was to ask what we believe nature is. And then, given that, how can we design with that idea of nature in order to get people and nature more experientially and consciously related? We can see that different world views manifest different expressions in architecture, different artifacts embodying the expression of different kinds of ideas. So here we have just one example of traditional approach, modern, postmodern, and integral architectural artifacts. So let's look at how architecture can embody these intentions at each level. And at each of these levels, I include a four quadrant diagram and it has overlaid on it concentric rings. Here it's showing the traditional levels surrounding an even deeper core of more archaic levels. From the traditional level, climate change simply does not exist. Climate change is a complex, abstract concept, absolutely unavailable to the pre-modern mind. What the pre-modern traditional can see is weather, seasonal rhythms, all of that is available. Evolution, not available. So in language, we use metaphors and other figures of speech to play a central role in our understanding of nature and then how we relate to it. Metaphors are one of the ways, one of the primary ways that we construct our meaning-making narratives. Designers are often using metaphors, right, as part of generating their design solutions. And in the traditional, we find such metaphors for nature as the primeval garden. We might talk about nature as a divine perfection um, or as an enchanted realm. And, and the other way of thinking about it, in addition to being something created by God, right, is that it's the wilderness. It's something to protect against us, uh, pr protect from. So the garden on one hand and the wilderness on the other, they're both traditional ideas. Now we can use traditional level thinking, even in modern architecture. Uh, and in that sense, we're connected to nature as a primal force, as a structure. And one strategy is this example of migration which is when people adapt and move from place to place or space to space. This is Charles Correa's Parekh house in Ahmedabad, India. It's a modern era house, but made without air conditioning in a mostly hot climate and designed to allow people to follow the cycles of the day and the season. Correa used these two different climatically derived sections that you see here. Uh, and they're placed parallel to each other. There's actually three sections in the house side by side. Uh, the winter section uh, is intended to be used on winter days and also on summer evenings. It's located on the eastern side of the building where it can be warmed by the morning sun and also has roof terraces above underneath that partial shade pergola. The summer section is a retreat. For hot summer afternoons, it placed in the protected center of the house with natural chimney effect stack ventilation. And then the service core is actually on the west side to block out the hot afternoon sun with only one small window. Another traditional level idea is to connect people to nature by amplifying the contrast of the environmental conditions or the polarities that are present in a natural condition or process. I call this pattern inhabiting the three realms. The three realms are the subterranean, the surface, and the sky, which are also elements of many traditional cosmologies. This house is by Antoine Predock in Texas. And metaphorically, one is entering into the earth through the stone cave. Coming out on the other side, um, you have uh, the building opening up to the forest with stairs ascending uh, to a bridge to get multiple observation heights. 
They call this the theater of the trees house. It was in response to a client's bird watching passion. It's all about multiple vantage points on nature. There's a central sky ramp that projects into the surrounding canopy of trees. And there's also finally, when you get to the top of the building, an enclosed roof terrace that frames the view of the stars for sky watching at night. Moving to the modern level, integral theory argues that modernism differentiated the big three, art, science, and morals. Or to put it another way, modernism differentiated self, culture, and nature. We begin to see those as much more distinct. And it's in this modern view that we begin to see climate change primarily as a problem of technology, as a problem of resources and pollution. And for the modern level, we began to tell stories and hear narratives using metaphors such as the great natural environment, nature as a tree or an organism, nature as a clock, or even nature as a farm. At the modern level, buildings can be designed to connect people to nature as the resources and services offered by nature. So nature is at once, a cornucopia and it's finite. It's richly abundant, provides all of our material needs. At the same time, its sources and its environmental sinks for taking pollution are stressed by our consumption and our pollution. Uh, so what would be uh, an expression, right, that would tell a story in relationship to those resources uh, perhaps something like this, Louis Barragan's own house in Mexico City. Uh, Barragan, work, his work exemplifies this idea of expressing a visible thrift. It uses spare materials, simple essential forms, uh, like you see here in this enclosed terrace. And Barragan's is an architecture where the space is shaped with only a few primary elements, light, color, texture and so forth, get forward. So the notion being that we can connect to nature via design when this ethical essentialness metaphorically associates us with the sensitive nature of materials and the processes that are provided for us by nature. Modern architecture's rejection of ornament is in part, of course, an expression of the industry of its time, the making, but it's also this, the minimal aesthetic could be read as a narrative, read as a narrative about resources that um, we are stewarding, that we're taking care of. Now, switching to a temperate climate, also on a more open site, this is Aero Saarinen's Miller House in Columbus, Indiana, and it really exemplifies this modern fascination with the visual connection of nature. The eye for the modern becomes the ruler. So the site plan shows this modern idea of infinite and continuous space underlaid by a Cartesian grid. And the modernists, of course, had a fascination with expressing indoor and outdoor space as a continuum of the same stuff. Right? Here's a detail. This shows, uh, this is the site plan, uh, zooming in, and it shows the house plan uh, shaded there as a diagram. So the house inside of a garden. And then zooming down a bit more to the house plan itself, also a grid. Right? And the grid extends beyond the house, but now these enclosed rooms are like little houses floating around in an area of open space, and that space itself flows to the outside. So we have the human order of the mind organizing a fully tamed nature. The columns are no longer at the corners, allow the extended overhead planes, which emphasize the horizontal connection to the landscape. The edges become inhabitable. The wall is now seeking to connect rather than to separate. And nature and human inhabitation interpenetrate. 
the more public spaces flow from garden to terrace to living areas. Uh, so you can think about this as uh, a modern experiential connection to nature as a rationally idealized garden, which can also be a powerful connection. If you've ever been to this house, it's a wonderful, beautiful place that almost everyone that visits says, yes, I would live here. Now moving to the postmodern level, uh, at this consciousness, uh, we have different, a uh, couple of different ideas that show up. Um, climate change uh, becomes described as the activity, the, the cause of that is, is humans and, and bad modern humans, thinking in modern ways that got us into this problem. And only from this postmodern perspective do we begin to blame people, right? That's the dark side of it. Um, we can also see, and the language begins to, to surface, uh, where climate change and nature itself are a constructed reality. So we begin to get metaphors like uh, the great web of life. We can see nature as a text to be interpreted, or even nature as oppressed, nature as victim. This house by Obi Bowman embodies this idea of the postmodern injunction that I call cohabit the site with all our relations. Native Americans also, they speak of all my relations. And when they're doing that, they're referring to other species and to the community of nature itself. And in a community, everyone that's a member of that community gets a right to life and to flourish. And so we have to preserve those. So we have the dark side and we have the light side of each. And so the light side uh, says that we're connected to nature when design becomes habitat. This strategy incorporates living species into green walls and living roofs and so forth. The architects of this hotel, the Park Royale in Singapore, say that it was designed as a hotel as garden. Uh, and they say that it actually doubled the amount of green growing potential of the site. And so you see these massive curvaceous sky gardens that are draped with plants, tropical plants, and they're cantilevered out of every fourth floor between blocks of guest rooms. So this is not an abstract minimalist garden of the modern. It's a postmodern metaphor for the ecological landscape. People are connecting to something more naturalistic, if not really a tropical jungle, but something more naturalistic than potted plants. And some would argue that the biomorphic forms are also a way to relate people to nature. And I partially agree with that. Yet that type of connection, the biomorphic form, I would have to say is pure postmodern symbolic metaphor. It's all about the narrative. The postmodern also sees on the technological side, the rise of passive architecture that heats, cools, and lights itself with natural forces. This is also part of an evolving green postmodern metaphor. This solar apartment house here is in Berlin. It uses a combination of different passive solar heating strategies and systems and active solar hot water. The apartments are double height, uh, have winter gardens, direct gain passive solar windows, more hybrid air collector walls, rooftop solar hot water, and so forth. And this kind of passive architecture requires what I was talking about earlier there with uh, Stefano the active participation of the users to operate it. And it brings therefore the user, the occupant, into a greater awareness of the daily and seasonal cycles of nature. Now, shifting to the fourth of five, the integral worldview. From here, one can inhabit many perspectives, many perspectives that are available on nature uh, and one can then start to reweave a more accurate and holographic view rather than identifying with particular perspectives. Climate change is then seen by the integral 
uh, perspective or the integral altitude, let's say, as a developmental problem. So we need more people that can um, uh, rise up to the rational and post-rational levels, as we talked about in an earlier lecture, and therefore understand climate change. And we also see climate change as a perspectival problem, as something that's an all quadrant, even all quadrant, all level problem, an aqua problem, if you will. And from the integral level, we begin to hear different languages. Excuse me, let me go back, just missed that one. Went too fast. There we go. We begin to hear language like the great matrix of perspectives. Uh, nature as a living community, nature as a holarchic nested context of systems within systems. Nature as a global entity, global ecosystem, and so forth. So the grand project of this integral level sustainable design is the synthesis of cultural order and natural order, right? not as previously understood, completely and radically separate things, um, but is integrated as reflective of a singular underlying structure that's paradoxically revealed through many different views. So we are connected to nature then at the integral level as complex living systems. Uh, Glenn Merkett's house here on a barren windswept site overlooking the ocean, it's situated to use large amounts of natural sunlight and ventilation. It's asymmetrical V-shaped roof and organized uh, oversized rainwater elements dropping down they express the building's relationship to the hydrologic cycle. The sound of rain can be heard on the roof and in the swirl as it moves down this downpipe. Deep overhangs, louvers, really high equator sun facing uh, slope, all express this careful fitting of the building and its forms to the processes of light, shade, sun, and wind. And those things are revealed and expressed. A project by Mario Cucinella in China expresses the idea that form can reflexively order and be ordered by ecological process. So the ecology shapes us and we shape the ecology. The, the nature shapes the building and the building also shapes nature. This is his uh, Sino-Italian ecological and energy efficient building. It combines passive heating and cooling for energy, natural ventilation, daylighting, rainwater collection, on-site solar energy. It's a net zero energy performing building. And at the same time, it's employing a certain amount of biophilic green. It's at the integral level that we begin to see passive design combined with biophilic intentions. This building is the Maggie's Center in Scotland for patients with cancer. Uh, it's by Riken Hall, bounded by a perimeter wall with echoing the Barragon House. And with the enclosed gardens, like uh, very much like the modern Miller House, it's connected to its landscape with these transparent walls. It's expressing this continuity of indoor and outdoor space yet not with the same kind of abstraction uh, that we saw in the Miller House with the Cartesian grid. There's nothing like that organizing the garden in the exterior. The views are more controlled. Uh, you can see views into small spaces that are open to the sky. It's, as you can see in this plan, a quilt of courtyards and rooms. Patients experience nature as healer, as the delight of natural process is intentionally incorporated and forwarded into their experience. So a deep connection with nature via design. And then uh, the transpersonal level, post integral, uh, if you think about it as a level, you can also think about it as a state that happens at any level. But if we think about it as the transpersonal level, then the self, 
You remember, we're now reintegrating the self, nature, and culture. The self is experienced as what Ralph Waldo Emerson called the oversoul, or what the Siddhas in India simply call the capital S self. Individuals then have the opportunity, the potential to experience being one with all of the manifest world, both humans and nature. So if we're talking about trying to engage all the levels of human beingness, then I think we have to engage the way in which people have deep, rich experiences that are super profound, uh, and many of those happen in nature. So uh, from this level, uh, climate change requires uh, some kind of enlightenment, right? It's a, it's a problem of the human soul. And at the same time, from the widest perspective, it's not a problem at all. The earth itself will live on. So from this level, we might hear metaphors for nature as the great self manifesting, nature as consciousness, nature as the abode of spirit, nature as the dance of divine Shakti in India. At this transpersonal level, we're connected to nature when we perceive in design the consciousness that animates all things. Strategically, we might say architects light a fire, a blazing fire with beauty, as we might say here in Faye Jones' Thorn Crown Chapel in the Arkansas woods. Uh, this gives us some access to the experience of an expanded self. This deep, real, aesthetic response to beauty, it resonates with the human being. So, I like to think of it as, as, as you might love your beloved and have access to the compassionate aspect of ultimate reality. So the experience of beauty becomes the access to knowing nature as this unified action of spirit in the world. So in all of these ways, design can help connect people to nature. People can be connected at their own level of awareness to their own understanding of nature. We shouldn't design just for one notion of nature and exclude other people, right? We need ways to begin to look at it from these multiple perspectives and get everybody in the game. Experience of nature, as we were talking about earlier, I say that experience of nature begets relationship which then begets meaningful action. And all these levels, each with their own narrative about nature, are needed to give people something to care about. Each level of designing with nature is needed to help solve the climate crisis. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, it's wonderful to have been, uh, you know, doing, doing five of these so far. And let's have a great conversation here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, we have, have we closed the the lecture time, or we can uh, try to ask some questions? No, no. Let's is... have, let's have another round of uh, questions if uh, people have interest. Uh, okay, so I would like to to ask you, Mark. Uh, is it nature or landscape connecting with architecture? Yes. For I, I think <laughs> that uh, uh, it's something course. something uh, useful to to understand because uh, archi architecture as a, a connection with landscape and what is the differences the difference please i close my my question yeah um many ways to think about that question right so the first part nature or landscape the second part architecture and landscape it, it depends on the altitude 
It depends on the cosmic address, depends on the perspective, right? And I think what academics always want to do is to try to draw a box around something and say, this is it and this is not it, right? Which is helpful. It's very helpful to make distinctions, to get your, your hands on it, right? So uh, is daylighting, uh, is the sun coming through my window and the sound of the birds coming through my window, nature? Yes, right? Is it landscape? No, right? Not necessarily. But is, does landscape also include nature? Yes. Right? From the modern perspective, right? If we're looking at a continuous uh, uh, map of the world, right? And everything fits into the grid, into our survey logic, right? Then, then the mind takes over and the landscape is, is both built and natural, but we like to make that distinction still, right? So at the integral level, we start to think more like a landscape architect, I think, because most of the landscape architects I know, they, they move faster than the architects into thinking about layering, stratifying, complex systems. They think about the site as being a place that's, um, you know, animated by living, active, dynamic processes. That can include cultural processes, and then we have architecture in the landscape. So from the integral perspective, though, there is not an, a cultural landscape and a physical landscape, an architectural landscape and a natural landscape. We are interacting, each one of us, moment to moment in the carbon cycle, right? There's not a breath we can take from that perspective in which we're not fully integrated in the carbon cycle of the ecosystem that our building lives inside of. Okay, I so think that, does that, that I don't know if that helps, but there's no one answer to it. That is the that is the notion, right? That you know, what was nature to the pre-modern mind? It could have been the wildland, the wilderness, right? It could also have been the paradise garden, but most people today would not think about it quite in that same way. I think that the last uh, architecture you show uh, is part of a landscape architecture. That is uh, something that uh, interpret the landscape with an attention to the environment connection. And this is also the spirituality of that place. Uh, in the other uh, situation, the light from the window is something, something uh, uh, technical, but uh, the, the kind of light that you collect from a window is architecture. Uh, so we have also to, uh, to create this uh, um, particular relationship between uh, architecture, nature, landscape, environment, and so on, no? That is always uh, something special for, uh, for our uh, um, yeah. yes. Yes. interpretation. From the biophilic perspective, um, we, can, we can overpower our natural lighting with our electric lighting. And by doing that, we flatten the experience. We dampen it. it be, instead of variability, we have con consistency, right? Mm -hmm. If I, on the other hand, I'm depending primarily on natural light, I have variability. That variability makes me become aware, aware that uh, the atmosphere is changing. The time of the day is changing. The clouds are moving that 
you know, I am situated right in an ex in a in a world uh, which is not fully a product of the human mind. So yeah, okay. the, the architecture is what is is controlling that relationship, controlling the quality of light. Um, so in the latest work I'm trying to do is to, is is to get at very simply that the organization of form and space, which mm -hmm. we're exploring in the schemas, is setting up the conditions to modify the natural world. And so the nature is act, acting on the building and the building is modifying the forces of nature. And those create a, a potential, a, a potential for a human experience, right? You can't really pull that, you know, you mentioned Khan, right? So I think Khan would say you can't really pull the, the building, the, the concrete, or the brick and the sun away, or the light, they're, they're one thing. Structure and light. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. I, <laughs> I ask uh, the, the, the participant to, to make a question. Please. Yes, um, can you hear me? Yes. Gabriel. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Melanie and Mark, for your, both of you for your lecture. Very interesting. And um, my question is uh, about uh, the architecture of today that, of course, uh, try to reach a a mutual uh, a mutual discussion with nature architecture. We try to include. And more and more the nature uh, into architecture project and also to respect to respect nature. So and I'm thinking about this architecture that is pretty new that try to be that. Of course, I follow the things that we just said, but this architecture that try to follow the um, the fact of being as much um, in a negative uh, resources possi possible to 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 generate as as much possible resources, so to have an impact very 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 little to the nature. Um, I'm thinking about this uh, Lacaton Vassal that is the Pritzker Prize of this year that has an architecture without um, putting. Uh, I should say green in the in their architecture, but they try to be as much respectful of the nature uh, with including the light and ventilation and all the things that we would say. And my question is about this. Uh, this is the nature. This is the architecture where where the the human lives and. I'm just I asking this is do we do we have to put the is it good for nature if we put the architecture into into the nature and if we put the nature into how cities I don't know if maybe uh, today can can we do without nature can we just make architecture without putting green and having also a good architecture, an architecture respectful of the environment without putting, I don't know, trees and everything. And I, it's a little, I mean, uh, lots more of this, but. Uh, okay, I think, we, I think we got it there. So, uh, yeah. so if I but get it, the question is, do, do we need green in yes. buildings or on buildings? Melanie, would you like to respond there? Well, I guess in my context, um, we don't, it's, nature is not always green. And so, of course, um, you can have a biophilic, or I guess you can incorporate nature in buildings without it necessarily being green, without it necessarily being alive. Uh, there are many different ways to to incorporate it. So in that sense, I think you can have 
positive experience of nature, even if it's, there's no trees, um, if you consider particularly the winter landscape um, that is snow dominated. And you're right, I don't know what you had in mind in particular when you said um, like cities versus nature, but when you think of rural landscapes where there is just snow covered landscapes in certain areas and there's absolutely no vegetation, I mean, that's also an interesting thing to to consider if that is a type of um, yeah um, opposition you want to create. Yeah. yeah, maybe. So that was pretty confused. I, I, I but I think there is uh, today when, for, for example, with the snow, that's uh, I mean, that cancelled the limits with the nature and the city because everything have the same the same material at the, in uh, one time in the year. I was, I was maybe more talking about the architecture itself at the uh, um, a more little scale uh, for building and uh, um, yeah, it's just about this this construction way and this moment where we have to find how to resolve the all the necessity of the architecture and can we there is a point where we say we are going to we are going to make plan because of course it's lovely and it's very important to live with it and of course uh, nature is not always green as you said and um, in 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 where my town where i live instead of five months of white like Melanie has in uh, Quebec, we have five months of brown. The leaves all fall away. We have no leaves on most of the trees. My, 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 my garden has eight large oak trees. Uh, each one is, uh, you know, 50 meters tall. Um, all the leaves fall for months, right? So we still have nature but it's not green uh, it's it's still biotic so the question maybe you're also asking is uh, if we have abiotic nature and biotic nature and ecologic nature more of the which requires the landscape as melanie was describing the three types can you have a nature connection with only the abiotic only the weather let's say, because you're always going to have some of that. And you can, as we were saying, bring the light in in a way that is perfect. So yes, the answer is yes, you can. Um, the uh, answer is also, it is a question of scale. So you, for instance, we might generate a principle that said that, you know, everyone had uh, what we might call nearby nature. So if the green nature, the biotic or the ecologic is not accessible in my apartment because I live in a part of the city that's ancient or I live in a high density area, then maybe I walk down and across the street to a park. So I might still have a view of that park, even though it's not part of the architecture. So you can answer that question at the room scale, the building scale, the block, the urban district, right? Yeah. The region. We can add and your different kinds of nature, right? Your different degrees of human impact are obviously going to change. So some people would argue that the wilderness belongs in the wilderness, in the countryside, uh, and in the city, we don't need any of that. You know? I can see, I can see that argument. Uh, I prefer, and most people prefer, if you give them the choice, the opportunity to not only have a plaza covered with stone, but also to have a garden whether that garden is a private garden or a public garden. If you ask them, would I also rather have a private garden? Yes, most people, if they had the choice, would also like to have the private garden. So architects 
there's a, there's a disconnect between um, what architects find um, as as order and what they enjoy and appreciate as architectural order, which is a, a an abstraction of the mind. And on the other side, what everyday people, millions of people in cities and, and countries, what they actually prefer and enjoy. And it is not the pure abstraction of the mind that they enjoy. They also have the level of the body, of the senses, of the eye, of, you know, the freshness of, of green air and plants and so forth. So, yeah, there we go. And that's the, the last point that you say about the um, human experience. That is, we have to integrate the, this human experience, not considering only the architecture and the nature, but this link between the two, because it's the point we are building for people. So yeah, that's that's what you, okay. what you just say. Thank, Thank you. you, Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, great, good, good question. And, and one that comes up over and over again for us. Is there uh, any other question? Paola. I have a question, can I? Um, yes, for I'll Melanie, uh, ciao. Um, I can ask you um, in the um, interesting diagram uh, you have uh, show use uh, the um, which aspect do you think are linked to the um, co culture of uh, Canada and which can be considered international need for each school? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess there are certain strategies or certain um, schemas or certain types of architectural design um, principles that will of course reflect climate. But I think a lot of the principles apply to any, any context really and can be transferred to designing schools uh, in different countries or even to designing any uh, building. Um, I mean, for instance, if we take the canopy place, it's not just about creating a sheltered outdoor learning environment for rainy days in Quebec. It can be applied to, to really any environment, to having an office environments where you can have people working outside or eating outside. Or eat. I think there are a lot of different elements that can be transferred, as I said, to different programs or climatic contexts. And so in a lot of the strategies, for instance, were about connecting with snow, but I mean, when there is no snow, there is other types of landscapes that you can connect to. Um, similarly, sometimes it's blocking from the harsh winter winds, but it could be in other, chance, in other climates wanting on the contrary to connect to those um, nice summer breezes that we also want here during the, winter, uh, during the summer. So I think there are lots of different elements that, that apply, and that's part of the idea of the schema schemas is to have an organization of form um, to potentially foster that experience but of course that form has a certain flexibility depending mm. on the, the context okay grazie one other aspect that's transferable is so melanie showed very briefly and i'm sure there was a lot there to take in, but we've talked about developmental levels um, quite a bit. And in working with schools, that the development of the child is something that has been studied very deeply over time. Uh, so if you think about, uh, so if I use um, uh, Gene Gebser's approach of looking at culture, he says there's five main stages, archaic, magic, mythic, and rational are the first four, that gets you up to graduating high school as a teenager. But we we then want to come as, you know, developed uh, 21st century thinking people, and we wanna raise things to the highest level possible. And I think one of the things that we discovered was that we're actually talking about the fundamentals also. Talking about basic sensations, you know, not shutting down the possibility for that 
uh, rich variability of experience to happen. And that that's actually something significant and important for child development is that they they learn better, they develop uh, uh, faster and deeper when they have good connections, uh, ac access to nature. So that would be something I would really look at if I was working at schools is what is it that we bring in, in our high level concept? And on the other hand, we have middle and lower level developmental perspectives, which a six year old just fundamentally sees the world differently than a 15 year old who fundamentally sees the world differently than one of our um, research fellows here, let's say in their 30s. Very different perspectives on what a school is for what, how we might connect and relate to nature. All of those are present at the same time. It's not one person, you know, experiencing the school. There might be hundreds of people experiencing it. Coming at each one, coming at it with a different worldview, a different mindset, a different level of cognition. And we as architects tend to get stuck in the one way that we want to see it. Uh, and now we have the, now we, we have all of this amazing knowledge that opens up the possibility of seeing the world through the eyes of other people. And I think that's magic. And that's not the magical level. Thank you, Paula. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, uh, we, I thank you very much for your lecture. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I have a question. Most examples we've seen architecture surrounded by nature and we can say introduced in the natural environment. And I really like I, the idea of introducing the concept of biophilia to the built environment. So somehow to the urban planning and uh, I had a question to Melanie if she were she was considering uh, to separate the examples where schools learning facilities were built in a dense urban tissue from those placed already somehow among nature. Uh, I don't think I did uh, for the simple reason that most of the schools that I studied as you saw in the photographs have I guess they're mostly in suburban areas. I guess that's the fundamental North American characteristic of these schools is that while there are schools in dense neighborhoods in certain cities, we tend to have created these schools surrounded by large expanses of land. And so getting to these schools is a lot of the time not um, not always a very biophilic journey, if you consider it because fundamental characteristics of the school being in suburb is um, students are a lot of the time bused to school. So we're not walking to school. And so from an urban design perspective, I'm thinking if we were to redesign the neighborhood surrounding the school, it's not necessarily the students that would benefit from that intervention because they do not always live in the immediate neighborhood of the school. So I don't know if that's really answering your question, but in a lot of the times, even I guess schools in the more rural areas, they will still be highly uh, surrounded by a built environment. And so it's hard in that sense to to design it in that way. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I was wondering, I uh, was thinking about examples of schools where are actually introduced in the, into a city that is densely constructed and uh, with no nature accessible uh, nearby. And Yes, so I was thinking about strategies that one could develop to create and conquer also space for nature in, in such an urban tissue. Well, it also makes me think of what Mark was mentioning before about having the possibility to have nearby nature, if ever, of course, that it, the neighborhood is so dense and that there's no space to have any sort of ex wide expansing um, green or white or brown landscape, uh, maybe there's a space nearby where um, that can happen. Yes, be considering urban planning. 
I, I would say from what I'm learning about uh, Italian cities is that some cities are growing and they're facing pressures of increasing development and density. And so in that scenario, you, you're also looking at a certain preservation of land uses, you know, preservation of uh, farmland or forest or uh, riparian lands, wetlands, uh, coastal areas, all of those things where nature diversity is uh, higher. On the other hand, you have um, many cities that are losing population. Uh, every week we get advertisements about one euro houses from uh, Sicily, for instance. Um, but also this, the, the historic uh, cities, small cities around Venice. Uh, I understand many of those are depopulated. So if you have depopulation, then you, you may have a existing density. But uh, one strategy is, is uh, what we call densify and withdraw. So in the American landscape, we've got kind of spread out density, very low density spread out. And so what what we need to do in a way to make a more sustainable pattern is to create more density in certain concentrated nodes, right? And then withdraw, tear down some of the suburbs and the highways and so forth uh, in order to have a more uh, productive landscape, in order to have the also the ecological services of the landscape continue to be functional. So there's the experience of human being, which requires that we have some nature in our immediate environments, right? Whether that's every day, moment to moment in my in my house or garden, or whether that's, you know, twice a day as I take my walk. We need that nearby nature as, as people, but nature as a, um, a living system also needs its productive capacities of of hydrology and ecology and so forth. And so we have to look at that pattern also and make sure that, you know, in the ways that we're settling the landscape in the future that, we, you know, we don't create deforestation and erosion and water pollution and kill all the fish and Stefano's going to solve that one for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Isabella. And uh, other questions? Are there other questions, please? I try to ask something else. So waiting for, <laughs> for other questions. Uh, what do you think about uh, the green blue infrastructures? and uh, for uh, for the biophilic design of city and uh, for the multicolored nature of cities the the green blue infrastructure mm -hmm. we Sorry. are in venice and uh, venice uh, has a uh, multicolored nature huh? yeah <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> We live uh, in the in the dynamic of uh, of the tides and so on. Yeah. And uh, and uh, the nature is not is not is not only green. This is, but uh, we talk about uh, uh, always of the about green, about the green blue infrastructure, about uh, ecosystemic. Uh, um, ecosystemic services and so on. Is it biophilic <laughs> or not? I like to think of that in the same way that um, I think it was Rainer Banham described um, in terms of in environmental systems in buildings that they can be concealed or they can be revealed. So, for example, I could make a building which was integrated with the um, hydrologic system, 
of the place. It was a piece of the blue infrastructure. But I could do that in such a way that we never saw the water. So in the my architecture building, it's the size of a, um, a football field. It has a flat roof. It collects lots and lots of water, which then drain into interior pipes that are painted the same color as the concrete in order to completely obscure them. They go underground and no one sees the water again. So I like to say with the experience of the water is only when I go to the restroom to wash my hands and I see just this much between the tap and the drain in the bottom of the basin. That's my experience of the hydrologic cycle. There's no sound of the rain. Only if I look out the window could I see. On the other hand, uh, let's say the project by Glenn Merkett, the roof tells the story of the rain even when uh, the sun is shining. The sound of the rain is apparent. The you know, visible movement of the water and tells me where it's being stored to use later. Right? So that becomes a, a more biophilic relationship to the hydrologic cycle. Uh, we can think about um, stormwater drainage like uh, a civil engineer. We can think about it like a landscape architect who's designing an experience for people. And um, hopefully we get both the eco function and we get the uh, eco experience. When we get the experience, now we're into the biophilia or ecophilia, I think. Okay. Melanie, are they doing anything with uh, blue infrastructures in Canada? Um, well, it was making me think of some of the schemas that we were um, thinking about in terms of what do we do with all of this snow when it melts in the spring? And it's a little bit of a different blue infrastructure, but uh, a lot of the time in schools when it's melting, the children can no longer climb on these snow piles because there's no resistance. But then again, since the snow is still present, we can't use I mean, the area underneath is not a play surface. And so it's thinking of ways to express this uh, this water that is in the process of uh, forming in a way that it is a positive experience of nature and not just a nuisance as it is often conceived at the moment because it's in the way or because we don't we can't use it to play. So it's transforming a little bit how we see it and thinking about not necessarily just water as water and water as snow, but what happens when it's in between and how can we, as designers, both whether it's in the building or in the landscape, find a way to think about it in all of its forms. I can I can certainly see how Venice would be um, considering the multicolored infrastructure, the blue and the green and the stone, whatever color that is. We have many colors. Yes, and, uh, but you know, being surrounded by water is a wonderful experience. Uh, Suzanne and I lived on a houseboat for uh, seven years, and uh, it was very inspirational. Uh, <laughs> the, the wind, the light on the water, the way it would reflect off of the water onto the ceiling and have uh, animated uh, light patterns cast onto the surfaces. Yeah, it can right. be very biophilic. Walk, walking next to a canal and looking at that light under the bridge, I imagine. And Mark, we have to work with the uh, water landscapes. <laughs> so, you have no so, choice, yes. <laughs> you have to collect uh, all the thinking about. Please, uh, any other question? Yes, Massimo. from from me. Do you hear me? I think so. I'm Massimo. Hi, hi, Mark. I I have a question or a reflection. Uh, your, your image. Uh, your yes. Uh, I forgot to put myself <laughs> online here. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I have a reflection about the second part, uh, most connected with the second part of your presentation, in which uh, I can really appreciate uh, the different uh, levels, uh, uh, starting from the traditional point uh, to the integral one or the post-integral one. And uh, I have adapted because uh, uh, I see that uh, there were a change of metaphors, a uh, change of uh, changing of meanings, but also and um, uh, a presence uh, uh, of technology every time uh, uh, bigger somehow inside your example, for example. And um, the role of the technology uh, is important, I think, in, in this because uh, it's like uh, architecture is uh, one of the medium uh, from uh, a person, the humans and the nature, for example, or the landscape but uh, we talk about nature uh, and the technology is another medium going inside this relation somehow. So I, I wonder if uh, sometimes uh, the true per, uh, perception of, uh, of uh, the nature could be at the lower level, levels. Because uh, uh, for example, uh, if I think that uh, nowadays uh, uh, everyone could go everyone more or less would go to the mountains taking uh, some technological uh, instrument uh, but uh, are they really experience what is a mountain for example or everyone can go in the ocean uh, by by boat but uh, is this experience the ocean for example so is uh, what do you think about this role as a medium of the technology well in the in the pre-modern traditional, um, the architecture was the technology for the most part. Um, of course, we invented the fireplace, the chimney, the wood stove for heating and so forth. But primarily the, the, the relationship with the, the forces of nature was through the architecture. The traditional styles of architecture had embedded in them uh, proportions for windows, for instance. Now, no one remembers the right proportions for windows and our spaces are poorly daylighted, mostly. In the modern, the technology became the driver, right? And it was a simple technology, uh, a simple technology of the machine, which then dominated the nature. And, and the architect became fascinated with that technology. And it allowed for changes in the architecture, changes in the typology, thick buildings instead of thin ones, right? We could operate the building all night. Working hours became fixed, not changing with the seasons and the light. All kinds of uh, things changed because of the application of simple 20th century modern thinking technology that tended to isolate us from nature and tended to create a boundary between inside and outside, which then enlightened modern architects then tried to break down and re in, you know, reconnect. But they also were able to do things like try to heat outdoor spaces. So um, for instance, um, uh, many, uh, some early modern projects uh, were using radiant uh, heating systems in outdoor uh, terraces, right? Crazy things, which, yes, gave us a more, a more connected relationship with outdoors, but came at crazy, um, at unreasonable costs to the environment where we projected those uh, opportunities, those, those uh, impacts elsewhere. Um, in the lecture I did with Suzanne, we showed um, the Farnsworth house by Mies. Um, you know, so here's a almost sealed glass box, right? which we don't think about as being disconnecting from nature, but it disconnects everything except the eye, right? Only the eye can now be really related and connected. The owners uh, wanted a screened, uh, screened terrace to keep the insects away, but Mies made them, uh, you know, tear it down, take out the screens because um, it didn't match his visual idea 
of relating to nature. Okay. Now we have more sophisticated technology. So uh, and, and now we can also, so the postmodern gave us the opportunity to look at history again. Right now, maybe in some traditions you never forgot history, but certainly in the North American tradition, we almost completely forgot about it for well, you know 50 years. And so now we can look back at what works, what's workable out of the pre-modern, what's workable out of the modern, and what's workable out of the postmodern. So now we have all that available to us. And we don't have to use technology in the sort of either dumb way of the modern or of the super um, sophisticated computer controlled way of our contemporary technology, where we can have windows open and close automatically if the computer says it's a good time to open the window. Right? So we don't have to rely on that level of, um, you know, abstraction of the human experience from what's outside. So there is, you can trace uh, the relationship of technology to nature connection. And there are some positive things about that and some negative things about that. Okay. But I wouldn't say now that I would either blame architecture or technology. The architecture itself um, in some ways is a technology. So um, the structure becomes the technology of not only resisting gravity, right, which is a natural force, but also telling us the story of the ordered sense of gravity by the hierarchy and the expression of that structure in the world. Uh, in the same way, the, um, the wall becomes fundamentally a separator and the window fundamentally a connector. Those are architectural technologies that don't just make space, right? They have a, a role in the empirical world. So they relate to nature and they also mean something. So that same wall in Quebec, in Knoxville, in Venice, in um, Rio, right? Means a different thing, right? it performs in a different way. So the technology is always there in the architecture, not just the mechanical and electrical and other kinds of, you know, automated or more mechanical type systems. That's my take is that, you know, you can't, nobody's gonna throw away, you know, staying warm on a cold winter night, you know, just to have an experience of nature. Right. We might, however, not heat our building uh, all the same in every space. It might even be nice to have your sleeping space be cold, and then you can, you know, snuggle up with your bed partner under uh, five blankets, and that becomes a great nature experience, but also a cultural one. Now, the sophisticated technology is also uh, drawing our experience with nature because uh, we have uh, the possibility to to trace our experience with nature by technology and this is another kind of uh, of sophisticated aspect but uh, uh, at last we have also to consider the abstraction of nature in our in our society and uh, our uh, the tension is uh, is making nature something abstract something not that is uh, that is uh, a material not always uh, um, in, um, well interpreted in, inside the, the the project, the awareness of nature is the awareness of of place. This is it is the awareness of process, and uh, so it, it is something that we have to uh, to make experience about. Uh, 
sometimes yeah. it some, sometimes it seems uh, so far from the experience. It is uh, a kind of abstraction that is uh, far from uh, the experience of, of life and uh, of place. This seems uh, a kind of uh, of consideration. Okay. Yeah, you're you're right on target there. Um, and and that's really an important level of distinction to say we we have our our fundamental experiences that all human beings uh, share because we have the same nervous systems, right? We have that fundamental experience of nature. We also have minds, though, because you know, build on top of our biology, we we have consciousness, and mm -hmm. so we do make abstractions. And and almost some would say all of our ideas of nature are abstractions, right? But we also find some delight in those abstractions, mm -hmm. right? We 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 don't want to purely live in the world of the abstract, but we can appreciate that while we also experience the sensory uh, richness of the world. We have the world of the mind that we appreciate as uh, people that study architecture. It is so. Any other question? If we have no question, I have to uh, say thank you very much to Melanie. Thank you very much to uh, Mark. It, it, it is uh, a pleasure to have this occasion for, uh, for the hearing your lectures and to have these five lectures in, uh, in connection with integral theory and uh, with the uh, possibility of research in this uh, approach. I think that uh, for us, uh, it was very important. The lectures are uh, available on uh, YouTube and uh, uh, you, you can uh, listen again to understand better what, what is the content. And uh, I say, uh, I say you thank you very much for all the efforts and for this impressive uh, uh, result. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Melanie. And thank you to all the participants. Yes, uh, thanks for having us. It's been a wonderful series. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed it and enjoyed the, the conversation also. And uh, thanks to Melanie. Uh, Certainly enjoyed having you here as a guest researcher and uh, look forward to seeing the great things that you're going to be doing in the future. Uh, thanks for sharing your work with us here today. Uh, thanks to Margarita for hosting and for you, Av, and all the great participants. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Ciao. Ciao a presto. Arrivederci.